what we call the generational spirits. It is the diabolic influences beginning with what's called the lost generation and then going back down to where we're at now. Exorcists refer to evil spirits that are passed from generation to generation as generational spirits. And the way they're passed essentially is because of the fact that um, once somebody commits a sin in a family, the demon gets into the home, then it starts picking on the other people, and then it starts getting passed from generation to generation. The reason it's called generational is due to the fact that it is often observed passing from parents to children. That's where you normally see it. <clears throat> General spir generational spirits are normally passed from one person who commits a grave sin again, introducing it into the household. Once the demon has gotten in his, his foothold in the household, he starts working on the people, but then if the person who let the demon into the house is someone of authority, it can be passed from generation to generation based purely upon the, his authority be allowing it into the home. So the, pe the children can actually end up with it. The passing of generational spirits, however, is not just between parents and children, but may occur with people who are in close contact with others for long periods of time. So if you work around someone who's possessed, eventually the demon that's around that person will start picking on you as well. The passing of generational spirits is a spiritual reality which occurs for a variety of factors. Among them are the state of soul of the one receiving the generational spirit. Someone who's not in the state of grace is more likely to be affected by the spirit that's being passed. Someone um, in the state of moral sin essentially lacks protection. So whenever you commit a moral sin, you lack the protection um, from being diabolically influenced. Some people are more susceptible to picking up other people's diabolic baggage than others, so to speak. Um, and so usually some people, they have to be around somebody for a little while, other people it's a little bit longer. The relationship one has to the person, for, for example with authority, can also affect how it passes. One's spiritual life, so if you're meditating every day, going to confession every day, going to mass on a regular basis, you're less likely to be affected by these things being passed. Use of sacramentals, wearing a scapular, using holy water, etc., those things can help quite a bit. Now, psychologists would simply attribute the behavior of a child as being learned from the parents. In a certain sense, that's actually true. There are certain kinds of behaviors which confessors, however, can testify that children contract them with no knowledge of their parents ever doing these things. So, for example, the parent will come in and confess a very strange sin against the Sixth Commandment. <coughs> they, the, the, inside the family life, it's a very chaste environment. The child who's nine will come in and start t complaining about here having temptations to those specific kind of odd behaviors. So it's not the child learning it, it's the spirit is being passed through that process. Generational spirits can stay with one person in a family and be passed through subsequent generations even to the fourth or fifth generation. The generational spirit comes, uh, sometimes can skip people in a generation. So you'll notice that certain people in a family all seem to be affected except for one person it seems to be okay. Everyone else doesn't seem to be affected. The generational spirits can be blocked or removed from a family tree, that is generationally, by various prayers said by the members of the family. Each demon that's passed has a very specific nature. And when a demon is introduced into the generational line, that demon has a specific nature and personality and will drive people according to that nature. What does this mean? Although, very often he'll do other things. So, for, when, for example, one person, he'll get the person focused on alcohol. So the person becomes an alcoholic, but the demon's nature is pride. Or, you'll get the person focusing on problems of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments, that is, in areas of chastity, when in point, in fact, it's a demon of fear. So, you have to find out, you know, is this demon of fear being passed generationally? Given the passage um, of generational spirits, we want to talk about it, though, in a broader context, in the last five generations of people. Demons invert the order established by God, and they often do so by mimicking the things of God. So God assigns each person a guardian angel, which is common knowledge among Catholics. Many Catholics, however, do not know that the pious tradition also tells us that God assigns guardian angels to families, corporations, certain buildings, churches, parishes, states, countries, and even regions. Demons do the inverse. By the permissive will of God, that is if God allows it, 
Certain demons afflict families, corporations, parishes, countries, regions, even religious orders and dioceses. So they'll have a very specific thing, and you can kind of see it. You'll go to a different diocese, and each seems to struggle with different kinds of things. And it's not just the complexion of the people. It's the demons kind of driving that. But one area often overlooked in this discussion of how demons invert the order established by God in relationship, is in relationship to a particular generation. Each generation, by generation we mean roughly 20 to 30 years, has a vocation of a sort. There's certain tasks that God is calling them to, certain evils to fight off, to achieve certain perfections, to advance the humankind in a certain way, and so God calls them to that, and whether they fulfill that or not depends. God assigns an angel to protect that generation, and sometimes the angel is one which is given to the generation to overcome the problems that it will face. But demons, by again, by God permitting, also afflict each generation. You don't need a doctorate in moral theology or spiritual theology to recognize that the church and the world are, are in a particularly bad state, both morally and spiritually. So the question is, is, how did we get here? And what is the complexion of our societal landscape? Now, this applies only to the United States, and well, it can apply to other countries, because I have been in contact with a particular theologian in uh, in England, and he seems, seems to see that, uh, you know, as they say in Latin, mutatis mutandi, that is, given the fact that it's in England, there's going to be some differences, things are very similar. But it'll apply differently to different societies. We are, there's obviously been a lot of scholarship done on how ideas, philosophical, theological, uh, affect the flow of history in each generation. But, the real, but rarely do we hear them talk about what's called the preternatural side, that is, what is the spiritual influence? What are demons doing to drive human history in the direction that they want it to go? The answer to how we got here is complex, involving many different agents, causes, effects, etc. So to simplify an explanation of the bad state of affairs down to the merely a preternatural problem, that is, we can't just blame it on the demons. If we did so, it would be unrealistic. But the spiritual forces driving history are real. And they're real because they affect real people. They affect us. Each individual, each one of us, in addition to have a guardian angel, it's the common opinion of theologians that Satan assigns, because he likes mimicking God, assigns you a demon to afflict you in a particular area of your life. And so it affects the flow of history because we affect the flow of history. Obviously, God is the Lord of history. That is, by his positive will, he inclines people to do good and to shape history. And by his permissive will, he allows evil people, bad choices by people, or even demons, to shape it. In other words, God is the ultimate determiner of where the flow of history is going to go. We are where we're at right now because God allowed it by and, um, and fashioned it in certain ways. The flow of history is ultimately up to him. But God uses us to, show, to shape that. Now, this does not mean that everybody in a particular generation, like the me generation for example not everybody in the me generation will suffer these problems I want to stress that again because always there's somebody got your overgeneralization not everybody in that generation is that way I'm, I want to make it clear each generation has people that don't get caught up by the in, by caught up in the enthusiasm or the spirit of that particular age so it's not everybody but we do want to talk about how we got to where we're at now so we want to start with what's called the lost generation if we go back to the generation which came of age during and shortly after World War I, and that generation was known as the Lost Generation. It was a term popularized by Ernest Hemingway in his novel, The Sun Also Rises. Some say that the Lost Generation is a term to describe a group of American writers who were rebelling against what America had become by the 1900s. At this, at this point in time, America had become a, a, a great place to go into some area of business, that is, you could make something of yourself if you just put the energy into it. However, the lost generation writers felt that America was not such a success story because the country was devoid of a cosmopolitan culture. It was very rural in certain ways. It just simply wasn't uh, metropolitan, you know, it wasn't big city oriented, etc. Their solution to this issue was to pack their bags and travel to Europe. Hasta la vista, baby. Okay, and a cosmo to seek a cosmopolitan uh, way of life. In the 1920s, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant work ethic was the only culture that was considered valued by the majority of Americans. 
up until this point, American writers were still expected to use the rigid Victorian styles of the 19th century. The lost generation writers were above and apart from American society, not only in geographic terms, because they only lived in certain uh, metropolitan areas, in certain pockets, but also in their style of writing and subjects they chose to write about. So if you've ever read any of the literature from that period, it's very strange, frankly. American society, not only in geographic terms, but also in their style of writing that they chose about, um, resulted in their being very unhappy with the American culture. The writers were instrumental in changing their country's style of writing from Victorian to the modern writing that you see today. This generation is known as the World War I generation, and it saw everything from the advent of the automobile in daily life. Some of them, my grandfather, who was part of this generation, actually used a, a horse and a plow to plow his field. So we're talking about that generation. They went from that, from literally horse and buggy, to a man being put on the moon in the course of their lifetime. So you're talking a drastic change in the way things happen. It's a complex generation because of that generation that did not accept the values of their parents. I'm thinking in terms like the Roaring Twenties where the morals began to kind of collapse a little bit, but that generation, many of them didn't accept that. So they didn't indulge in the hedonism and pursuit of life uh, opposite of a solid work ethic. Rather, most members of that generation followed the tradition of their parents, especially in the area of religion. One hallmark of that generation was their appropriation of suffering. By appropriation means they took it, they accepted it. In my experience, in the experience of many, and from what we have read, this was the generation that could endure suffering, regardless of how severe, without complaint. They went through the First World War, although they did not fight in it, many of them. They went through the Great Depression. They also went through the Second World War, but most of those did not fight in that either. But the ability to endure suffering, to offer it up, was almost at the level of instinct. It was so ingrained in life that for them it was just part of nature, part of life. In fact, for them, suffering was such a part of life that to talk about it was like talking about the rate of the grass growing outside. You just didn't do it. It was just part of life. Life was suffering, a vale lacrimarum, or a veil of tears, as we say, and so one simply did not talk about it. You just didn't talk about your problems, things that were painful, things that were difficult. And therein begins the problem, in my estimation, that would lead to a complete societal breakdown. The generational spirit of the lost generation was the spirit of incommunication, not miscommunication, but incommunication. They did not communicate, they did not simply talk to their children, or at least communicate to their children, the ability to embrace the cross the ability to accept their suffering. Now this becomes a key point because each subsequent generation not only inherits not only inherits that demon from generation to generation so virtually everybody in our culture today the minute you suggest you know maybe you should take up some kind of penance you get this immediate wilting oh I can't do it you know there's just this inability to embrace their cross but Not only do they accept that one, but then on top of that is layered. So by the time we get to the generation that's coming up, they have basically got the baggage of all the last five generations of diabolic spirits, which we're going to talk about. They didn't learn, they didn't teach their children to appropriate one's suffering for virtue's sake, as they had done. This is not a conscious fault on their part from what can be gathered, but it is a common experience of their children, many of whom are alive today who can testify to the truth of this observation. This was the generation of austerity and simplicity. They o- owned only what they needed, no more and no less. When my grandparents died, when my grandparents died, other than the furniture and a few other things, the only thing that they did not need was the television. That was the only thing in their house that we could see that they actually didn't need. Everything else was um, actually stuff they needed. So that was the only thing. Part of this was the effect of suffering through the depression. Part of it was from simply not having a lot of money throughout life. However, the simplicity and austerity was a sign that even after the suffering had ended, they did not indulge themselves like we tend to do. That would come in a later generation. To indulge oneself, one first has to be willing to avoid the suffering. Had gra- they had great discipline interiorly and maintained a family structure, albeit sometimes a bit too heavy-handed. 
The husband maintained his headship of the home and wives submitted. Even though they struggled with the curse of Eve, that's the, um, the line in scripture is your desire shall be for your husband. And in Hebrew, that de the desire for means the desire to control. That's what women get stuck with. Adam got stuck with effeminacy. He capitulated his headship, gave up, didn't do what he was supposed to do. Men were men and women were women. Boy, that's a phrase for today. There was no effeminacy. Life was hard, and so softness was not an option. If someone was soft, they literally thought there's something obviously wrong with this individual. Okay. Their children are called the greatest generation. Tom Brokaw coined the term the greatest generation to describe the generation which grew up in the United States during the Great Depression and fought during the Second World War, as well as those whose productivity within the war's home front made a decisive material contribution to the war effort. Brokaw opined that it was the greatest generation inside had ever produced and that the, those of that generation fought not for fame and recognition because it was the right thing to do. I'm going to address that one later. This generation is sometimes referred to as the GI generation. However, it is hard to share Mr. Brokaw's enthusiasm for that generation. While it is true that the men and women of that generation are some of the most decent people you will ever encounter, they're kind, generous, loving, open, approachable, etc. There was a flaw in that generation that began a cascade of events that would land us in the worst state in recent history. That generation grew up during the Great Depression, but they did not appropriate their suffering while going through it. They did not embrace their cross in the manner that their parents did. They often, and you can read this, you can see it, you even listen to them, you can tell it. They often complained about their suffering they went through their lack of food and a variety of food. So when you listen to them talk about the depression, oh, all we had was beets for dinner. Hey, at least you had beets, you know. Um, they often, uh, they, the austerity that they had to live under, they didn't like it. They fought the Second World War, but came back determined to, quote, this will never happen again, unquote. They didn't go to war to do the right thing. They went to the war because they felt obligated. And when they came back, they were disgruntled about what they had to go through, and they weren't going to do this again, and they weren't going to make their children go through it. They did it because they had to, not because of idealistic intentions. Underlying their great deeds was a spirit that was unwilling to suffer. They could deny themselves, even with ease when necessary, but they didn't like it. They didn't gain that virtue of, of mortification in which there's delight in the suffering itself that the saints had. Their generational spirit was a lack of mortification, an inappropriation that is a willing to accept suffering. How could this accusation be levied against a generation that did so much for this country, fought the Second World War, and were hallmarked as very hard workers? They did it because their goal was not to attain spiritual perfection by the perfection of virtue. That was not their goal. This was a generation in which the, dis, uh, the discussion of virtue collapsed. This was the generation that stopped the discussion of, of virtue. Rather, it was to obtain something materially better primarily for their children. They indulged their children, as we shall discuss in the next generation, to the degree that they could, within the confines of decency, but they indulged them nonetheless. They indulged them by giving them things which prior generations would have warned against, and they indulged them by removing any obstacle to their indulgence. How do we know this? Let us not forget that this is the generation which blocked the passing of the tradition in the church intact. It was handed to them intact. By the time they gave it to us, it is in shambles. That's that generation. Why? Because the following of the tradition requires self-discipline, self-control, above all, self-denial. If one is to pass on the tradition intact, he can only do so by putting himself aside, making sure that he does not interject himself into it and pass it on without tainting it. The, quote, greatest generation, end quote, did nothing of the sort. It was not that generation that wrought the uh, Vatican II and its, it was that generation that wrought the Vatican II and its aftermath. It was that generation that brought about a loosening of disciplinary requirements in the church. It was that generation that allowed dissent, unorthodoxy, immorality to have it in the life of the church. It was that generation that began the sweeping under the carpet of the pedophilia problem, which, by the way, began under their watch. Most of the pedophiles that were prosecuted in the 70s and 80s were in the seminaries with them at the time, or under their watch in the 60s. It was, the, uh, it was the homosexual problem among the clergy. They were the ones who swept that under the problem. 
they rejected and did not enforce or teach the immorality of contraception. It was that generation that gave us Roe versus Wade, gave us the implosion of the contraception laws. It was that generation that gave all of that. We tend to look at them and say they're wonderful people, but what, what happened with their generation? They would not detach from their child. That is, you talk to them, and any time you discuss the last 40 or 50 years of changes, it's like this ugly child that they've given up. They won't admit the thing is ugly, and they won't admit that it's a problem. And they have this inordinate attachment to it. The remnants of that generation still won't admit, even in the church today, that it's declined in every single category except conversions, and that's only because of marriages, they know. Every single area of the church has declined under their watch. Every single one except that one. In effect, that generation was handed a church that by some accounts could be considered at its prime, catechetically, because the people knew their faith generally, morally, spiritually, and financially, at least on an external level. And they passed to us a church whose members are spiritually, morally, financially bankrupt, and catechetically ignorant. That's what we've got now. In order to maintain discipline, to maintain orthodoxy, to maintain the good of the church, self-denial and embracing the cross was necessary. Instead, the indulgence of embracing the modern world was given pride of place. The cross requires not embracing the world, but denying the legitimate goods it offers, not because they're bad, but because they are good, and us laboring under original sin, if we don't deny ourselves, we're going to end up a problem, but this requires embracing your cross. It was during this generation that women went into the workplace as a result of being called to the war effort. So they had to go to factories to work because the men were all off fighting war. And the women liked the financial freedom that, that independence gave them. So when they came back out, they didn't want to submit. The women of that generation succumbed to the curse of Eve in an unprecedented way. The women in the generation beforehand would have considered it absolutely shameful and scandalous the way that generation of women refused to submit to their husbands. They hated their husbands and they did not think he did anything right, regardless of how good of a man he was. Some of these guys are some of the best people you'll ever meet, and yet their wives can't stand their guts. And you're like, wow, I like the guy. What's wrong with him? Right? <laughs> They have major control issues regarding their husband and sometimes their children. They hate the role of women and their place in society. I love that line from St. Thomas. He says, women are in three states. She was created, Eve was created in the state of subordination. She was created under Adam, but the hallmark of that stage was that he took care of her. He loved her, he was solicitous to her, he treated her well. But then after the fall, she entered into a state of subordination, which means Adam didn't treat her very well after this. But he said, in heaven, the third state, Women are neither in a state of subordination or subjection because some women rule in heaven. So I tell women, your place in this life is not the issue. It's the sanctity with which you achieve through that process that's going to be the issue. And then some of you probably have my hair and I tell people, look, I tell women, look, if you want to control your husband, don't go for the short-term payout in this life. Submit to him, become holier than him, you'll get a higher place in heaven, <laughs> then you can boss him for all eternity if you want. <laughs> They rebelled against her husband's authority. They disrupted the peace of the family life. They usurped his authority. Usurpation is the sin against justice, where you, do, where you act against someone's rightful authority. They permitted triangulation among their children, where children go from one parent says no, they run off to the other parent, can we do this? Yes, so they do that triangulation thing. They permitted that. They would contramand the decisions of their, of their, fa of their husbands. They're the ones who contravene the husband's authority to discipline although not always. They lacked control over their spending, and unlike women of the lost generation, they had no taste for austerity and the virtue of simplicity, as is evidenced the taste they had often had for their own homes, which they felt were beneath them, even when they had these phenomenal homes. They always felt that somehow or another they were gypped in life. They didn't get everything they wanted. They were the ones who began the use of contraception, as well as all women who succumbed to the curse of Eve due to the natural law written in their hearts with their husband's authority and the role of separation. They acted against it and became angry and bitter. When you don't fulfill the natural law, you're going to become angry and bitter. Uh, other than depression and some things of that sort is the outcome of denying the natural law. The men entirely succumbed to the curse of Adam during this generation, giving women anything they wanted to keep the peace. And just give it to her. No, I'm not going to argue with her. Just let her do it. You know, that kind of a thing. They did not discipline their children. 
They did not maintain authority within the home nor in society, but capitulated it to the women and even to their children. The hippie movement and Woodstock are testimonies to the failure of masculinity in the culture to maintain order and authority. It was that generation that didn't do it. They overturned decades and even centuries of tradition on the social and political sphere. Again, it was under their watch that Roe versus Wade occurred. They tolerated too much from their wives, children, and society because, they, because to hold the line was painful and requires embracing the cross. When your wife is chaffing at you, it's painful. It's difficult to deal with. Uh, it is arguably that the greatest generation is one of the worst generations in the history of the church. For the modernism, one of, if not the worst heresy in the entire history of the church was permitted, promoted, and embraced under the eye and watch of that generation. Think about what that means. Possibly the worst heresy in the entire history of the church was permitted, promoted, and embraced by that generation. How can we say it's the greatest generation? That was that generation that began to persecute the orthodox and the traditionists and the devout. And what of their children? Ooh. Now we come to the baby boomers. It's the next generation. A baby boomer is a person who was born during the demographic post-World War II baby boom between the years 1946 and 1964, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. This generation is also known as the hippie generation. For the hippie subculture that originate, originally arose in the United States in the mid-1960s, the hippies adopted the disordered values of what was called the Beat Generation. Now, if you know anything, the Beat Generation was the, um, the uh, greatest generation. It was a small segment of the population, a lot in California, where basically they were the generation that already began the experimentation in drugs, sex, and rock and roll. That was They were already starting that process in the 50s in the Beat Generation that generation was the one who accepted that side of things. They uh, listened to, um, they created their own communities, listened to psychedelic rock, furthered the sexual revolution, and some of that generation used a variety of forms of drugs to experience alternative states of consciousness. This generation came of age at a time when technology could indulge them through the various disordered activities in which they engaged. The generational spirit of the baby boomers uh, generation is indocility through intemperance. What does that mean? Because the greatest generation, quote unquote, indulged them and did not pass on the traditions of their fathers which required discipline and self-denial, the baby boomer generation was allowed to engage in various forms of intemperance. They just indulged themselves. They gave them everything. They bought them all this stuff. They let them eat whatever they want, etc. They never had to deny themselves, etc. Because uh, even though things weren't perfect, life was per fairly plentiful in that time, at least in the United States. Aside from those who went to the Vietnam War, there was very little hardship in their lives except that which ended up as they ascribed to their parents. It's all my parents' fault, right, that I'm messed up. Actually, there might be some truth in that in some of the cases. But the intemperance led to indocility. Docility is the virtue by which a person is able to easily be led by someone who knows more and who is above him. In other words, it's the person you go to because you don't know what you're doing. So they have to lead you. Due to the fact that the appetites, that is our emotions, left to themselves through intemperance will not tolerate being denied, the baby boomers became indocile because to be led, again, requires self-denial. When you don't know what you're doing, or when your parents tell you what to do, or someone else tells you what to do, you have to deny yourself because you might have these other inclinations that are opposite of that, but you just have to do it. It requires a willingness to be humiliated through exposure of one's ignorance and folly in order to show what is the right thing. Also, intemperance affects judgment by making one think that what is in fact sinful is morally acceptable. St. Thomas observes that one of the effects of lust is hatred of God because he forbids the use of the generative faculty, that is, you can't engage in certain kinds of sex, in a disordered way. The hatred of God is simply the extreme of indocility in which one put away what one wants in order to do what's right. But the indocility led to profound impiety within that generation. Piety is the virtue by which one honors those who are above them. It's the virtue by which we honor our parents, honor our forefathers, honor the priests, etc. The baby boomers simply unpack the impiety of the rejection of the tradition of the greatest generation which blocked it. The greatest generation rejected the tradition of their forefathers. We got something entirely different, and so now the 
uh, the hippie generation simply unpacked that impiety. What the greatest generation failed to realize is that by not embracing their cross, one of the greatest crosses they would have to watch is their children who would be undisciplined, disrespectful to authority, and licentious. They'd just be out of control. The baby boomers are, in the end, example of the words, you sow, you reap what you sow. Because they did not discipline their children and would not, uh, not act according to discipline, they failed to form their children morally. And this became a huge problem with the children that the Jim Hippie generation begot. But the impiety was not merely towards their parents. The impiety is a twofold virtue in which one not only honors one's superiors, but also takes due solicitude or care of those under you. The baby boomers are hallmarked by an inability to be led. You can't correct them. You can't tell them anything. They have a complete disrespect for authority, and they're constantly clamoring for power under the guise of democracy. But once they get in, they're absolute dictators because they're just following their appetites. However, once they may manage to gain the position of authority through democracy or some other means, they're either ruthless, disregard the goods of those under them, they're selfish and overly demanding, or they simply do not care about the state of affairs under, uh, in relationship to those people under them. What's the next generation? The next generation comprises two subgenerations. One's called Generation X, and the other one's Generation Y. The children of the baby boomers are known as Generation X and Y. While there appears no universally agreed upon set of years which constitutes this generation, it's generally considered to be those people born somewhere in the early 1960s through the early 1980s, usually no later than 1981 or 1982. This generation is sometimes called the 13th generation. Generation Y describes the demographic cohort following Generation X, or kind of that interim generation. Authors have used birth dates ranging anywhere from the mid-1970s to the late 1980s, early or mid-1990s for Generation uh, Y, and, uh, or as late as the year 2000 to define this generation. This generation is known as the me generation because the generation of this generation, the members of this generation are noted for their narcissism and that is their spirit. It's all about them. Well, what do you expect? First of all, you won't suffer, so you got that demon going on. Then you indulge them so these people are intemperate because uh, from their, their parents were intemperate and they, di they didn't temper them. And so what did they do? It made them selfish and self-centered. The generational spirit of Generation X and Y is a spirit of amorality, amorality or absence of religiosity. The members of this generation are often hallmarked by nice personalities. In other words, they're kind of nice people, actually. Somewhat easy to get along with, and they're not mean-spirited at all, generally. They are not immoral in the sense of which you'll see in the next generation. In other words, they're not going to steal your property, they're not going to hurt you, they're not going to try and rip you off, generally speaking. Uh, they don't like arguing, as a general rule. They tend not to see the point in religion, however, and this is the generation that was the first to be allowed to, quote, choose which religion they would follow, unquote. That set the stage for the sixth generation, which is their progeny. We'll talk about them in a minute. This generation, because everything was given to them and they never had to work for anything when they were younger, anything that requires effort is annoying to them and is ignored, which is why this generation has no attention to detail. One time, I had to make 11 phone calls to straighten out a prescription because the nurse, who was from this generation, was too lazy to check a single box on a, on a computer screen. Literally. Too lazy. Just to do that. All she had to do was click it. That's all she had to do. But instead, I literally lost hours of time because of it. But that's how they, that's how they function. Because, oh, I don't want to do that. They just don't bother. They don't, it doesn't impact them that they're affecting you. They have no attention to detail. They're beset by a profound sloth in which if it takes a few seconds to press one more button on the computer, finish job, they're not gonna bother. They have no driver ambition in the colloquial sense. Even uh, so, uh, societal commentators are noticing this. This generation doesn't have any ambition. They don't wanna better themselves. They don't wanna make a better life for themselves. They should not have to work, they think, but they feel entitled to a paycheck even when they don't work. It has no sense of responsibility because they can get out of any mess they make or leave it to others. When I was in school, if you acted up and ended up in the principal's office, 
you prayed that your parents didn't find out about it. Because if your parents found out about it, not only did you get the tongue lashing or whatever kind of lashing at school, but you got the lashing at home, not this generation. The hippie generation would indulge themselves. So when their kids would do something wrong, instead of correcting the child for his benefit, they would hammer the teacher for correcting the child. So what did the child learn? The child learns, oh, I can do whatever I want and get away with it. I don't have to do anything. You know, and if I do something, if I really mess up, well, that's someone else's thing to clean up and take care of. This generation, when, it, uh, when its defects are pointed out, when you say, hey, you know, you got this problem, or when the person has done something wrong and is pointed out, they never own up to it. Never. Regardless of how obvious it is. Instead, their attitude is, why are you attacking me? I didn't do anything. Well, yeah, you just did this. Yeah, but that's no big deal. Why are you attacking me? Rather than realizing, hey, maybe I should correct myself. So as a result of that, they ended up having no sense of right and wrong. And as a result, they have no moral compass. Because the hippies trained them to have, it didn't train them to have one. So any correction in their view is considered rude and out of line. What are you doing? And it seems gratuitous. Because they violated the rules and were defended by their parents and not made to take responsibility for their behavior, rules and laws don't apply to them. In other words, you'll say, you'll, you'll have a sign, don't enter. You just walk right in. Yeah, hey, whoa, what about the sign? Yeah, it doesn't apply to me. You just go right in, right? Rules don't apply to them. Why? Because every time they broke the rule, they got out of it. Not every time, of course. I'm exaggerating there a bit. They only understand the penal aspects of the law. What do we mean by that? If you get punished for it, and they don't like it, and they think it's, you know, out of line. This was the generation under Dr. Spock. Now, Dr. Spock said that you should never spank your child, and from that point on, you got that problem. And as a result, they never associated bad behavior with pain, and good behavior with reward. As a result, they have no conscience or sense of right and wrong, and because they were never punished, they never grasped the binding force of a law. Intellectually, the, the law, when you tell them this is the law, it just doesn't seem to hold any force over them. They always got what they wanted, whether they followed the law or not. This generation has no sense of the binding force of the law. As I mentioned, uh, this is also, this applies not just to societal norms and laws, but even to the law of God. This generation thinks that even the slightest excuse exempts them from the laws that bind under the pain of mortal sin. You'll sit there and you'll talk to me like, by the way, this is the generation that all started living together right before they got married and they, they and you tell them hey you know the says in scripture you're not supposed to be doing that eh, yeah but, but you know it's better to try it out before you get married than to see if it's gonna work really you know but part of it was also the fact that they uh, they didn't just didn't think the law applied when you tell them hey by the way not going to mass on Sunday and Holy Day is obligations a moral sin yeah but I'm too tired to get out of bed today you know God would understand I, I you know or well, you know, don't these people understand that some people just are busy out these days? You know, there's no concept of the law binding them. This also means uh, that uh, because, uh, or this also means that when they do something wrong or have a defect, they have no shame about it, which is the segue into the demon of depravity, which is the demon of the next generation. Because they are narcissistic, Generation X or Y has absolutely no common courtesy because they were never trained in it in a way whatsoever. Um, rather, they were trained to focus on themselves. Courtesy requires circumspection. You've got to be looking around, paying attention to others. This lack of courtesy extends to everything from holding the door for other people to giving deference to their elders, getting out of the way when people are waiting on them. This is a this is a butte. One time I'm driving down the road, my parents were complaining about a similar thing recently. I'm driving down the road in a car. These people from that generation were walking smack down the middle of the road. They had the whole road blocked up. <laughs> they see you back there. It has absolutely no impact on them psychologically that there's cars stacking up behind them while they <laughs> finally I get it's a little bit of a narrow place and I manage to get by them. They start flipping me off. And I'm like Hey, you're the guy in the road. I could have ran you over. <laughs> How about that for the penal aspect of a law? <laughs> All right. Anyway. You're like, <laughs> this generation, because they lack any shame, they also have no sense of honor. 
They have no concept of honor or the value of it. Honor meaning the perception of other people of your excellence, the manifestation of excellence. They have no concept of that whatsoever. Effeminacy has become full blown in this generation. The men have absolutely no inclination to man up, and in fact they feel the roles of women are completely arbitrary and don't apply to them. They also have no shame in relationship to talking about their sexual experiences or activities, which then leads to Generation Z. Generation Z is a common name in the U.S. and other Western nations for the group of people born from the earlier mid-1900s to the present, with the earliest date starting in 1990. This generation is the one that is completely plugged into technology. It is the generation that has gone without a coherent moral code, religious doctrine, or society norms. They didn't get any of it. Even the, even the um, X and Y generations had some semblance of it because their parents would kind of talk about it from now and then. This generation is getting none of that. I mean, literally none. Generation Y knows about the moral code, again, from their parents, but they just don't believe it applies to them. But Generation X has no moral formation at all. They have no concept of moral right and wrong. This generation, Generation Z, is the one that was left to the daycares, where no moral training was ever given them. This is why they can go into McDonald's and mow people down with an AK-47 and have no compunction about it. It doesn't phase them at all. There's no moral code. Unlike Generations X and Y who have been spanked or reprimanded from time to time when they did something wrong, not too much, but once in a great while, even though not was taught to them as to why it was wrong, this generation received no moral formation at all from their parents. If they did receive moral formation, it tended to be what is in the general culture today, where sins are described more in terms of how did you hurt the environment, or um, uh, or how you know generally how did you you know did you hurt God's feelings? Well, first of all, God doesn't have any feelings, but you know you got that you got that kind of a problem. This is the generation that ended up really having little or no moral compass at all. For this reason, those who are older in this generation are beset by a spirit of depravity as can be gained by any cursory search on the internet many of the older members of this generation are engaging in forms of activity and behaviors that prostitutes of ages past would have refused to do so out of just basic decency this is the inversion generation in the sense that often what they considered acceptable the term moral is not used by this generation since psychology has managed to reduce that to the pejorative or simply remove it is the inverse of what the greatest generation would consider acceptable Everything from living together as a norm before marriage to viewing same-sex marriage as a non-issue because they cannot see why others have a hang-up with them. If they love each other, why not? This does not bode well because the younger members of this generation are starting to show the signs of a spirit that will come full-blown in the generation that's being born now, which, is called, which I call the sixth generation. The, um, in my estimation, the next generation, some of which are under the age of five, and which will continue for the next decade or so as the sixth generation, since it is the sixth generation um, since the lost generation. This generation will have a spirit that is not like any of the other generation. Exorcists have known that the introduction to the occult, that is to Satanism and witchcraft and things like that, is almost always accomplished through immorality, especially in the areas of sixth and ninth commandments, that is depravity. Once a person has fully indulged himself in those areas, the demons begin leading the individual down a path towards worship of them and involvement in demonic activities such as witchcraft or Satanism. The previous generation's slow descent into sexual depravity of the prior generation, fueled by a prolific pornography industry, has opened the door to the spirit of paganism. We are already seeing the precursor of this spirit. The wildly successful Harry Potter series, which by the way, I can't figure that out because it's poor literature, Twilight Saga, and other vampire and werewolf movies. One thing that is of note is how attached Generation Z is to the Harry Potter series and how vehemently the parents of the Generation Z will defend the laseity or permissible, uh, permissiveness of their children reading books and watching these films. Moreover, the vice of curiosity is full-blown with the advent of every form of paranormal TV program and movie as well as the drastic rise in witchcraft which exorcists and other priests have noticed. As saints and theologians exorcists have pointed out for centuries, the vice of curiosity is one of the primary entrances into the occult. Curiosity is not being used as the, in the colloquial sense of something simply wanting to learn more, being interested. Rather, it's to indicate an intellectual vice in which a person seeks after knowledge that's not proper or suited to them. The fathers of the church observed that Eve's first sin was curiosity. 
an exorcist have known for repeat, from a repeated, repeated experience, excuse me, that children and adults who do not curb their interest in occult practice and things pertaining to the demonic can find themselves the companions of them. But make no mistake about it, the trajectory of moral depravity and curiosity in occult matters will result in the next generation wanting or actually having open worship of other gods. It's coming. You even see it. There's precursors. People, you'll see it. People say, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm into Horus worship. It's already there. It's, it's, but it's, this generation is the one that's going to get stuck with it. So, before we conclude, these spirits are, gen uh, these spirits are cumulative. So, the generation that's coming up now, they're going to have indocility through intemperance and unwillingness to suffer. They're going to have sloth. They're going to think everything's entitled to them. They're not going to have any sense of moral code. They're going to have all these things. They're going to have depravity, too, which will be part of it. Although what you may see is a phenomenon that's starting to occur in Japan where people are not violating the Sixth Commandment but for very strange reasons. So not normal, rational reasons. So you're going to start seeing uh, sh uh, people shifting around where they might not engage in the violation of the Sixth Commandment but that's because they're into some other thing. So this incommunication that began with the lost generation begat an unwillingness to suffer. And that unwillingness to suffer led to an indulgence of the generation that followed after that, intemperance and docility, and then to a spirit of narcissism, depravity, and now we're heading to paganism. What does this all tell us? That is not, this is not only a commentary on the generation, it is a commentary on the in, interior life of every one of us. If we do not embrace the cross, if we are not willing to suffer, we will dissipate into every sin imaginable connected to intemperance. It's just the nature of the beast. But, so you're not completely depressed, we'll end on some good news. When you look at some of the kids coming up now in the sixth generation, they're starting to show extraordinary signs that we haven't seen in millennia almost. And let me give you a couple of examples. I know a child that started meditating at the age of five on his own just started meditating on his own. I have seen children as early as seven and eight years of age start fasting on their own. They're just literally starting this austere practices on their own. And they can suffer phenomenally. It doesn't seem to phase them. They're also, you're starting to see that they have a particular kind of a grace where they're able to quickly see the truth of the doctrines. And when something opposite is proposed to them, they just think it's preposterous. God is preparing a Catholic revival. I think he's preparing it. You can see it. The grace is there. It's coming up. But we're going to have to go through something pretty ugly before we get there, I think. Okay. Any questions? Yes, Father. That's a whopper, huh? Yeah. Referred to the vice of curiosity. Yeah. What is that, that tipping point from, that throws you into the, the vice of curiosity? Well, the, the formal definition of curiosity is pursuing knowledge that's not proper to your state in life. So it means, it means, for example, um, and by state in life means, you know, like if you're married, you have no business looking on the internet and looking at stuff that's against the sixth or ninth commandment, because that's a pursuit of knowledge in that area that you don't have any business doing so, um, or pursuing knowledge of the occult. Oh, let's just, you know, let's find out what the witch books say. Let's try the Ouija board and see if that works, you know, stuff like that. Um, as a Christian, that's not proper to your state. You shouldn't be getting involved in that stuff. Yes? I'm curious. In I'm sorry. I'm wondering. In watching the debates last night, which I could stomach about 30 minutes of it, and then I was out of You're it. better than I am. Um... I'm wondering if you just wonder how quickly we have sunk to the point that our nation is accepting this group mm -hmm. as a possibility because there's no decorum. No. There's no dignity. None. It's the most childlike behavior I think I've ever seen. See, yes. And yet you've got that whole audience roaring and praising and Yes. It's, it's the just, sign. To me, it's, it's just scary. It is. It's a sign of the intemperance. People, people like it because it's indulging their appetites. They want to see each other beat each other up. Some of it is because they're just sick of the government. They want something straightened out. You know, the philosophers have been very clear ever since from Plato and Aristotle made the observations that 
A democracy can only survive if the people are virtuous. If they're not, it implodes to, it first begins in demagoguery, which is what we're seeing, we saw with the Clintons and with Obama and things of that sort. But it's also, uh, but then after that it leads to tyranny. See, that's what's coming down the pike in this country. And because, let's, let me just put it this way. The philosophers have noted that there has not been a single democracy in the entire history of the world that has not ended up in tyranny. So, you know, if we don't have virtue, this is what we're going to be get. This is, what, the, the people that are sitting at the top of this thing, they're just a reflection of us. They're just a reflection of our culture. Yeah. And, you know, it tells you that this is, that we're, that we're a mess. And it's going to be, you know, it's not going to be pretty. Yes. Uh, you alluded to uh, meditation and uh, fasting. I, yeah. I mean, uh, can you kind of touch on things to get us out from underneath these spirits? Well, you have to act contrary to them. You have to be willing. The first thing is you have to be willing to suffer. That is the that is one of the most people stall out and become mediocre in their spiritual life because they're just unwilling to suffer the process of rooting out their imperfections and defects, and so that's the first thing. And that means once you're willing to suffer, then you have to start dealing with the intemperance, which means you have to start cutting yourself off from stuff that you indulge yourself with on a regular basis so that you gain mastery. As St. Paul says, I bring my body into subjection. Then, of course, it's the, but the, the docility will follow on its own. People who, people who are willing to suffer and do that kind of thing actually will actively look for people to lead them so they can achieve the right thing. They won't be narcissistic because they're willing to suffer. I mean, if you're willing to suffer, you can't be narcissistic, you know, unless you've got some twisted view of suffering, but that's, that's mental illness. But if you're willing to suffer for the sake of the virtue that it begets in you, you're not going to be narcissistic, and you're not going to be, uh, you know, descend into depravity. Um, and you're definitely not going to get involved in the stuff that involves the demons, because the demons, their play on us is always through concupiscence, which is the desire for pleasure. That's where they work on us all the time. And so if you can get that willingness to suffer, you can very quickly separate yourself from all that other stuff. Yes? Um, this is not the first time I've heard people talking about seeing manifestations of lots of grace with the yeah. young children being born right now. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what do you do if you, you know, have a child that starts having inclinations for things like that and you've got to... Um, direct them somehow. Um, I think what you should do is, is if you have a child like that, is talk to a priest who's knowledgeable and say, okay, what do we have to do? Because you have to remember, sometimes the children, strangely enough, they seem to be moderating themselves. Usually when children start doing stuff like that, they can get a little bit immoderated from it. But they're not, which is kind of a strange thing. But I think it's primarily a matter of oversight and making sure that the types of penances and mortifications they do are proper to their state, how old they are, and whether they can properly handle them. Um, and then also making sure that if they're doing them, it's not affecting their charity. So it's a matter of just making sure that what they're doing is moderated and according to their state, and making sure it's not impacting any other virtue. But if it's something that's really extraordinary, you know, it might be something you need to talk to a priest a little bit about and say, you know, this my child is five and I'm finding him meditating. What do I do? You know, <laughs> which has happened. Yes. I'm, I'm a little bit amazed that I'm hearing what you're saying because before I came tonight, I talked with someone who said, what are you doing this evening? And I said, go to stations, go to mass, and then I'm going to listen to a talk to my father Ripperger. And they said, oh, really? Will you ask him a question for me? And oh, these are always the worst. Now, <laughs> I almost don't even have to ask it because your talk addressed what they asked me. But I, one of the questions I have to ask is, are you recording? Yeah, so I'm going to put it on the Internet. Excellent. Because what this is, is it was an article. It was a very short article because they restricted you in Latin Mass Magazine, so I just kept it. But I wanted to amplify it, especially in relationship to the greatest generation. Don't get me wrong. I have a great affection for that generation. It's the generation of my parents. They're lovely people. But as a pack or a group, it was a mess. So, um, and I think that the sad thing about that generation is they've never kind of owned up to it. This, this yeah. Was, I, I'm going to ask the question that they asked me to ask you because I want everybody to hear it. It's right in with what you were talking about. The question was why today are there so many young people living together outside of marriage, having babies outside mm -hmm. of marriage, 
And they don't have any conscience about it whatsoever. They don't, and that's why. It's because it's an accumulation of generational spirits, lack of moral formation, ultimately. So, because to, to do for more, we know, parents know this, and priests know it when they're, when they're you know, helping people form themselves. There's a lot of suffering that goes involved in help, helping your kids, because, you know, when you got to spank your kid or you got to be, you know, firm with them, it requires self-denial on yourself, right? And a lot of parents don't want to just let the kid do it, right? Put him in front of the TV. Interesting thing. I'm waiting for her to actually write the article. The one thing, because she, she's a phenomenal psychologist, she's a f fantastic researcher, and she, she was noticing all these people mowing people down, right, inside of, uh, not the Muslim people coming in causing terrorism, but the, the actual people from our culture going in and shooting people, and she said, I wonder, I wonder if they have a common element. And they only had one thing that she could find that was in common, daycare. The church has known for centuries, or millennia, that the primary period of moral formation for a child is between two and six. That's where the associations of right and wrong are built up. They don't fully understand it yet, but that's where the primary moral formation occurs. That's when they're in the daycares getting no moral formation. It's also daycares for a child very often are traumatic because they're dropped off, the other kids are beating them up, and they can't, you know, the parents, nobody's paying attention to them, they're not getting any affection from their parents, which is why women are given a stronger emotional life, which is a good thing, um, as long as it's directed to the children, not their husband. But the point is, is that you know, what's happening is the children aren't getting the proper psychological nursing, and they're ending up with what they call disaffective disorder, which is basically the inability to emotionally connect with people. That's why they can mow them down, and they have no compunction about it whatsoever. For them, it's just part of the video game they've been playing for five years. Someone else at the front. Yes. I have a friend who was telling me today that he had like severe trouble believing that God exists in this mm -hmm. generation. He was saying, um, "If God exists, how can my life be this bad? Like, where is He?" So, mm -hmm. would you have anything like to say to that? Like, to maybe help? Like, I was kind of. Well, the, the suffering that God allows in our life is ultimately so that we will um, become better through it in some way. When you're younger, that's a little hard to see, I think. You're just like, this is just, what's, this is pointless. But in point in fact, it's actually not. Um, there, it's, it's our approach to it. So I would just tell them, look, you can take these things that are bad in your life, and if you approach them properly, they can actually be to your good, that you can actually rise above these things and become a better person through it. So, and then what about God? Well, why does God allow? You know, people ask me that, you know, people who are possessed ask me, why did God allow me to become possessed? I said, are you growing holier? Yeah. Have you been staying out of mortal sin consistently? Yeah. Are you conquering venial sin, for the most part? Are you rooting out your def defects, even though you got this guy on your back? Yeah, there's why. So, it's through that process that they actually, it's through the grind, it's through the difficulties that they actually um, are able to attain a level of virtue and perfection as a result of it. The main thing to do is to not shrink from it, just look at it and say, okay, what's the virtue I need to do? Or what's, what, what is God calling me to do in this particular case? God allows it. I, ironically, the saints, it's been the doctrine of the saints from the beginning of the church, that the degree of suffering you undergo is directly proportionate to the degree of holiness that God wants you to attain. So he, if you're suffering a lot, it means he's calling you to an intimacy with him that he's not calling, that, a level that he's not calling other people to. Ironically, it's a sign of his love, the saints say. It's just our approach to it has to be done, looked at it properly. As human beings are falling under human nature because we don't want to suffer, this horror of suffering that we have, we, we can't see how God would be a part of that. But in point, in fact, he's right there in the middle of it. I always tell people, look, if you want to get closer to Christ, you've got to get closer to the cross, and that's just part of it. Yes. So, with what you just said, we have, I mean, this culture, so many ways to make ourselves not suffer. Right. You know, and in some ways, they're, they're the norm, you know, painkillers and, and uh, aspirin and all these different things. But yeah. if, you're, if you're having the normal pains and sufferings that come uh, to most people, should you reject those things and say, no, I should accept the suffering and not try to make it easier for myself? Or what should be your attitude towards that? It depends on whether it's good for you spiritually or not. In other words, most sufferings we have, we should be willing to suffer and use for our spiritual betterment. But there's some kinds of sufferings you shouldn't tolerate, like 
if you're being attacked by a demon, you don't say, oh, I'll just accept this. No, you got to beat him up, right? There's certain crosses that Christ intends for us to only care for, uh, temporarily, so we need to unload them. Other crosses are for our life, but we, we, have, we still have to work, use those crosses. We have to accept them when they come, but if it's connected to some kind of moral imperfection or if it's a type of cross that is affecting other people bad or what have you, then we have to address that externally and try and get rid of it. I mean, we have an obligation to try and ameliorate people's situation, but we have to be careful not to make people's lives too easily. My father said, his, his words for it is, you have to raise a man a little lean. And by that he basically meant you can't give him everything he wants. You have to make him work for stuff. You have to give him responsibility, which is ironically the two ways you gain masculinity. And that's uh, that willingness, that in embracing suffering and taking responsibility. Those are the two primary ways, and that's that's what we have to we have to engender in people. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I feel as though I'm surrounded by people kind of my age who are focused in very cynicism or skepticism, mm -hmm. um, a lack of belief in anything, and even nihilism sometimes. Yes. How do you see that shift taking place from believing in nothing to believing in this this alternate thing, especially in a culture of like intellectual pride and even or intellectual yeah. form sometimes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really true. Uh, I think that it the the usually. Usually, there's a turning point in a person's life where they have to think to themselves, is this all there is? There's got to be something beyond this. The other side of it is, too, is cynicism and the skepticism are self-defeating. Because if you're cynical, you should be, or skeptic, skeptical, you should be skeptical about your skepticism. Right? So it's self-defeating. In other words, it, when, we, when, we, we, when we take a, a, a critical eye of, uh, to something, and by that I mean in the sense we're looking at it to make sure we understand precisely what it is, there is a certain kind of, not skepticism, but a, a critical judgment we have to say to exclude anything that's silly. But what's happening with that generation is the sad part of it is, and this is something I didn't include, which I probably should, is your guys' generation, the one a little bit older than, than them, not you particularly because you were actually, uh, many of them probably were raised in homeschooling or in other uh, situations that were very helpful and beneficial. But a lot of these kids were raised in a communistic slash socialistic slash materialistic education system. This is why now you see they have no problem with Bernie Sanders. He's an open socialist. What's wrong with socialism, right? Because they've been taught all, all this good stuff about socialism because they don't understand how things function. So I think that part of it is, I think there's two parts, two components with it. The, uh, the, one of the advantages of, that, of your generation not getting any formation, it means if, at least if they haven't become completely cynical, they're open to some intellectual formation. You can say, well, wait a minute, what about this? What about that? And you can lead them. They're more likely to be docile than, um, than uh, at least on an intellectual level. When you get to the moral issues, sometimes you get a bit of an issue, but when you, at least on an intellectual um, level, I find that if the right arguments are presented, a lot of them are just saying, oh, it just makes sense. How come I never heard this, right? So, yes. Um, to build off of that, you mentioned about uh, this, or this generation having uh, less, or less formation or mm -hmm. um, this generation uh, leading towards uh, like a Catholic revival, as you put it. Right. Um, I think that this kind of gets at a, a question that I have about um, uh, generational, almost like virtues. You're talking about uh, generational spirits. Spirits, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That is, I guess more towards the positive aspect. Yeah, I mean, in a certain sense, um, when we, in other words, certain angels were created in order to engender certain virtues in human beings. And so when parents have, um, you know, when parents are leading particularly virtuous lives, it's not only just the training, but they've got the, the, the angels around um, and the saints, too, connected to that which will then help the child, and if the child embraces that, it'll pass to them in a certain sense. They have to still build the virtue themselves, but you're right. I mean, you, you do see that in family. There's certain families that just, you know, have a certain greatness, a certain magnanimity, or they have a certain, you know, um, ability to suffer. Um, some of them just have phenomenal humility, you know. So, yeah, I think that's true. Um, I'd like to see more of it. <laughs> yes. So you were talking about um, parents offering, like, prayers, help with generational spirits. 
Yes. Okay, so I have two questions for that. First, where are those prayers? Mm. Second, um, I'm assuming you'd have to have proper authority over the child. So, like in a fostering situation, you know, the state's giving you authority, but you don't truly have that proper authority. Correct. So correct. Yeah, not until you adopt them. Once you have legal custody, then you have then you would have the authority to do so. Um, the prayers, uh, you can email me and I'll get them to you. So, yes. Throughout uh, your talk, you gave uh, some wonderfully concise definitions of virtue. Hmm. Um, where would I be able to find def those very concise definitions of virtue? Uh, if you email me, I'll send you the list of the definition of all 64 virtues. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, prayers, just, for instance, my father is a 32nd degree Mason. Yeah. So when I say that in the presence of my family or just my whole family, well, with Freemasonry, it's a little bit of a different thing. You actually have to say the prayers to break the Freemasonic curse, which is a specific set of prayers. So we can get those to you, so that that generational stuff doesn't pass to your children. So I can say them, or is the whole family? Well, it's best if your whole family can say them, because then they're less like, especially if they're teenagers or above, then they're less likely to be affected from the stuff that that is going to be part of that. So, one last question. Yes. Mission. Yeah. And so, what do you see, or do you believe, is the mission of Generation Z? And what what part will we play because we have been blessed? Can we be here? Um, well, the, the easiest way to figure it out is: so, what is the what is the generational spirit of Generation Z? Do you remember? What's that? Oh dear. <laughs> 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 no, yeah, it's, depra it's depravity. Your generation was the one called to excel in chastity. To restore the... <laughs> to, no, it was. In the sense of it, it was... The, it's, it's, its mission was to restore the chastity that was lost by the hippie generation. Which is interesting because some of the people of your generation have admirably maintain their chastity all through high school, all through, all the way up to marriage. I'm admirably. Um, in fact, I just did a marriage in California where, where that was the case. So, um, you know, and so I think that there, it's there. It's just a matter of accepting it and working with it. But it means you've got to be willing to suffer, too. So, okay. Uh, we're going to stop there. Otherwise, we'll go on all night. Um, and if you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis patris et filii et spiritus sentient supervos et maniat semper. Amen. Amen.